So to get started, I am employed by a dietary supplement company that produces products promoting sulforaphane production, and I am an inventor to one issued patent and four pending patent applications based on the phytonutrient you guys are going to learn about today, sulforaphane and health support. And before we really get started into the talk, I just wanted to give a little bit of a background. And so it all starts in middle school during a family dinner. We were watching the news at, at the table, and there was a, a little segment on the Jarvik 7 artificial heart. And I was not interested in medicine at the time yet. This is the mid-1980s. But I fell in love with this procedure, you know, that you could actually you know, do surgery and put in an artificial heart. So I made that my middle school science project. On one panel was the normal anatomy of the heart, and on the other panel was pathophysiology of the heart and discussions on why people end up with heart disease in the first place. And much to my surprise, genetics was only a very small part. The major part was the environment and lifestyle choices, you know, lack of exercise, improper eating. Um, and genetics was just a really small portion of why a lot of people ended up with major heart disease. So I, from that moment, though, I really became interested in medicine. And I wanted to be a cardiac surgeon. That all changed in 1990 when a really close friend of the family, Andy, passed away from a rare form of cancer when I was a junior in high school. Um, I started working with his physicians that summer before 12th grade, and I actually started working on my first human clinical study. What we learned during that time, just like I had learned with heart disease, is that cancer also isn't a majority caused by your genetics or what you were um, you know, you got from your mom and your dad and your, and your DNA, but really a, a whole lifetime. It's a combination of your genetics, which is a small part, but really our environment, our insults, both toxins and our lifestyles, even improper food, again, can ultimately lead to mutations in these toxins that we ingest. And we've been hearing a lot about this during these talks. So from that moment on, I wanted to be a pediatric oncologist. I was blessed to be accepted in 1995 to Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, and everything was going great. And in my second year, one of my first diagnoses was my own father with metastatic colorectal cancer. And for the third time now in my life, when I was trying to figure out why on earth did my dad get colorectal cancer, no family history whatsoever, it was an environment again. And in this case, it turns out that uh, around the time my dad was diagnosed, the Cleveland Clinic had just had a symposium on the link between eating red meats and any kind of meat, even chicken, fish, red meats. And when we cook them, we create this heterocyclic amine called FIP which when we ingest it gets metabolized, can go into our cells, and has been linked to colon, prostate, and breast cancer. So I got pretty angry, and I thought, you know, do I want to spend the rest of my life waiting for people to get sick and then treat? Or there's got to be a way to prevent and, and diminish some of these diseases in the first place. So not really treatments to, to, to um, prevent disease, but really is there kind of things we can do to promote health and wellness? And that set off a journey now um, that I'm going to share with you a little bit here and then hand off to Jehoon. So this title, it's not just about, you know, this conference is an ASD conference, but for all of you in the room, I think we all know from these lectures, we must take control of our own health destiny. And that's the major theme. And Hippocrates, many, many years ago, had said the function of protecting and developing health must rank even above that of restoring it when it is impaired. Kind of the reason I told you that story. Should we really wait for people to get sick and then treat, or can you do something up front? And then this is a great quote to Eleanor Roosevelt. In the long run, we shape our lives, we shape ourselves. The process never ends until we die. And the choices we make are ultimately our own responsibility. And again, you'll see by the end of this talk that there's a lot that we can do on a daily level that really can help promote our health and the health of our kids as well. And just something for food of thought, so to speak. Is it really the US healthcare system or the US sick care system? Um, when you go and look at the statistics, we spend more per capita as a country than any other country in the entire world, yet we're ranked 50th when it comes to the health of our population. Um, this is a little outdated, but still holds true. Healthcare costs as a country are more than education, the military, and infrastructure alone. Pretty staggering. And when you go and look into what that healthcare spending is all about, 75 cents out of every dollar in healthcare goes to these chronic diseases that, to not just me, many will argue, are largely avoidable. Obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, lung disease, all those stories I shared, you know, the obesity, the type 2 diabetes, it's really majority of the time uh, an improper diet, not eating the right things chronically, and lack of exercise. And so this is typical. When I was still in the wards, I, I started med school. I actually never got my MD degree. I loved research so much. I, and you'll hear why. I went back in and, and started 
doing research on this phytonutrient called sulforaphane. But this is polypharmacy, and it wasn't uncommon, the picture on the, on the right here inside, to have patients come in with many, many pharmaceuticals. And what was always interesting is they weren't always curative. Um, and so the question is, is, is it fair to call our system healthcare when we have a specific drugs for a specific disorder model developed to treat symptoms that largely ignores the root causes? And that's the main problem. You know, I love there's a big place for conventional medicine. More recently, as I got into promoting health and wellness, it's really integrative functional medicine where you get to the root causes of why people show up to a clinic, for example, with a pain in the finger. You know, and, and you can understand that maybe it's due to chronic inflammation from maybe even a, an improper diet. So really, we need to look at the root causes. And this is just one more bit of background here. This is called imprecision medicine. This is the top drugs that are prescribed in the United States and how many people it takes to prescribe these medications for one person to have a success rate. And down at the bottom is Capaxone for MS. It's, it's number nine in the list here. You have to treat 16 people to get one good favorable response. And that ends up being many, many hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's just very interesting. And, and what I didn't share in cancer, um, when I started working in the cancer labs early on, you know, we used to think that everybody with breast cancer gets treated with the same regimen. It turns out that every single tumor is unique. You can actually look at not the genetics that we uh, got at birth, but what you acquire over the course of a lifetime, every single tumor is different. Every single metastasis is different than the original tumor where it came from. So there is no one size fits all. It's really, there's lots of different things at play there. So this imprecision medicine model is still being used today over and over, unfortunately. And so how can you take control of your own health destiny? And I would argue the easiest thing, and again, there's many lectures at this wonderful conference, um, phytonutrients. We can go back to our original roots here, the fruits and vegetables that we all should be consuming. And I'll tell you a story, though. It's not always that simple, but these are the phytonutrients. And what are they? It's a big, it's a big word, but all these different colors of vegetables, they all supply these wonderful chemicals. Again, they're called phytonutrients. They have a, a way of impacting us positively and promoting health and wellness. And the one we're going to focus on today and what this fall will be 20 years of my life invested on is the greens, the cruciferous vegetables, and specifically a compound that's derived from precursors found in those vegetables called sulforaphane. And the reason that I got really interested in this is because of the early studies that were published in the 60s and 70s that found this really incredible relationship between the more fruits and vegetables people ate, the better their overall health. They had good health overall. And coming from Hopkins, we were always trained, if this is true, what does it imply? What does this truly mean? There were researchers at the university at the time that I was there that were trying to peel back and figure out, okay, if people eat fruits and vegetables, why is it that they're getting this response? And one lab in particular, the Tally lab that I had the pleasure of working with when I was there, actually determined that in the crucifers, and these include broccoli, cauliflower, and kale, there's a precursor chemical called glucoraphanin. It's found in the cell vacuoles of the plants. And then in the cell wall, sequestered in the cell wall, there's an amazing enzyme called meracinase. And when an insect or a human chews the plant, usually the seeds or the sprouts, and we'll see that in a few slides later, you take this glucoraphanin and convert it to this wonderful phytonutrient, sulforaphane. And the reason I've spent almost two decades of my life now working on this one compound is for the following reason. And that's at the cellular level, when sulforaphane is produced in our body, it goes into our bloodstream, into many different types of cells throughout our entire body. It activates this master switch, it's called NERF2, a transcription factor in our cells, goes into our, our DNA, literally binds to our DNA, and upregulates the expression and ultimately production of these wonderful cytoprotective antioxidative enzymes. Many, many hundreds of these. And these are enzymes that you want around at your cellular level to protect you from stress. And so this is probably the most complicated slide, and I tell everybody when I give this, there's not a quiz or test after this, so you guys can relax a little bit, but we already learned about the one on the left, the phase two enzymes. Again, there's more, hundreds of these that are upregulated as soon as sulforaphane is present in, inside your cells. It helps to get rid of some of those toxicants. I told you about my father, the heterocyclic amines. There's been studies that have shown that sulforaphane can help mitigate the downstream negative effects of, of that, as well as benzene and other toxicants that are found generally in our environment. Also, oxidative stress and reactive oxygen species, when we breathe, you know, in our mitochondria and our cells, we're constantly creating ATP, cellular energy, but we create these oxidative stressors that can be damaging to our proteins, DNA, and, and the good fats. On the far right are the heat shock proteins. It's another wonderful 
class of enzymes inside our cells that I can almost imagine most of you have never heard of, right, the heat shock proteins. These are also very protective. They protect us from these environmental and internal toxicants that we're constantly exposed to day in and day out. And then the third pathway in the middle is my absolute favorite. It's the downregulation of the NF-kappa B pro-inflammatory pathway. We all know now from, you know, looking at news articles, reading stuff in newspapers, these talks, chronic inflammation is horrible. You, you want to try to minimize inflammation as best as you can. Amazingly, sulforaphane has been shown time and time and time again to mitigate and modulate the overall chronic inflammatory pathway NF-kappa B. And so a lot of people ask, can't you just eat lots of broccoli or sprouts? Like, why did I go ahead and create a product? And unfortunately, I still tell people, and I have two daughters, we definitely tell them to eat their broccoli and crucifers. But if you want to get the sulforaphane story, it's not so easy going to vegetables. And the reason is because due to cultivation, the types of seeds, um, and, and even exactly where they're, where they're planted, you don't know if you're going to have enough of the glucoraphanin and the meracinase enzyme. Those are those two precursors needed for sulforaphane production. Sulforaphane is not naturally found in these plants, the precursors are. And this chart's a little complicated, but what you can see is the, the seeds have the highest levels of these precursors. And then by the time you get to three-day-old sprouts, if you're lucky, you'll have some. And then by the time you get to really market stage broccoli, the problem is, and labs have studied this before, they might have the glucoraphin, they might have the meracinase, they usually don't have both. And even if they do, they're at very low levels. And then the other problem, and this is, occurs with my own kids, most kids don't like to eat raw vegetables. So, you know, you microwave it or steam it. The meracinase enzyme is a protein. When proteins are heated, they actually denature. It never really recovers, and it no longer can function. So you're left with broccoli, if you're lucky enough, with a lot of glucoraphanin and no meracinase to convert it into sulforaphane. So again, continue to eat broccoli. It has great other micronutrients and fiber. But if you're trying to get the sulforaphane story, that's not always the best solution. And so what we did is we actually ended up creating Avmacol. Um, and we launched this in 2012. It provides standardized amounts of that precursor glucoraphanin as well as the active meracinase enzyme. Not just meracinase enzyme, it has to be active. So every incoming lot of raw materials we test first in our chemistry labs to make sure that enzyme really is active. We take it through all of the production cycle just to make sure that we haven't hurt the enzyme at all during production. We do a 12-hour urine collection study with six healthy volunteers and we actually can tell how much sulforaphane we're supporting with each one of our lots. And so we call this kind of system the sulforaphane production system, SPS. And, you know, in, you guys are just getting here a little bit later. People always ask me, you know, if you had an elevator ride, how do you describe really what Avmacol does? And I think everybody can agree. Everybody's stressed at one point in their lives. You know, traveling here maybe on the plane, on a train, you know, going through traffic every day. If you have kids, sometimes they're wonderful. But every now and then, a little bit of stress ensues, you know, getting the practice, helping them with their homework, making their meals. Um, so there's stress all the time. And what do we do as an organism? At least this is what I do. I'm an avid cyclist. I you know, work really hard and do a lot of stuff during the weekday. And then on the weekends, I go out and I spend time in nature. I cycle, resets, I recharge. It helps deal with that, that stress that we have. Well, Adam McCall at the cellular level is that nature walk. It actually helps deal with, as I've been sharing, all these stresses that, are, that happen with our cells, that, that, both endogenous sources of stress and those external sources like the toxicants these environmental pollutants. And so I'll share a little bit of the supporting research. So what this is is a true translational model where we're going to show first what we do in the laboratory and then translate it out into the real clinic. So you can see from Jihoon what he's been seeing with his patients. But this is behind the scenes. We taught you about these pathways. Um, you don't just have to take my word for it. We'll show you some of the research we do behind the scenes to ensure that we really are doing what that slide was saying, inducing two protective pathways, downregulating the inflammatory pathway. So I don't know if anybody in the room has ever seen, this is a, called immunohistochemistry. So what we see are liver cells. And can you guys see the green? That's the cytoplasm. The purple is actually the nucleus. The green is actually staining for an antibody specific for a really important phase two detoxifying enzyme, quinone oxidoreductase, NQO1. If you haven't heard of it, it's an enzyme you want to be upregulated. Um, our estrogens and benzene, when they get metabolized, they actually form quinones by accident at the cellular level. This can actually bind the DNA and cause major problems at the cellular level. Quinone oxidoreductase can actually metabolize further, break down those quinones, and make it more of an inert chemical that they can be recycled or removed from our body entirely. So what you see, there's a little bit of green staining. Our cells are always making these protective proteins just at low levels, because remember I shared, we're constantly inundated with stress, both from the outside world and internally. This is what happens when you get a physiologic concentration if you were to take the amount of 
uh, of sulforaphane or make them out of sulforaphane that our product helps to, to support. And you can see it's, it's like a green light has been turned on. That's an antibody staining for that particular enzyme. And the best analogy, it's like a dimmer switch. Something that was low, we now crank it up and ramp up the production of these important phase two detoxifying enzymes. Another really important class of protective enzymes are those heat shock proteins. This is heme oxygenase one. The same liver cells, you see kind of little faint green lights there in the background in the cytoplasm. This is what happens after sulforaphane is introduced to those cells. Again, the light is rapidly uh, upregulated, it's turned on, and again, we're, we're ramping up the dimmer switch. And so, lastly, I shared with you, we test all of our products. This is, we deliver glucorapin, the active marasinase enzyme, and it's just like any other chemical or toxicant. You know, the body typically doesn't make sulforaphane. We get it from the outside world. Our body processes it, and ultimately, the majority of it is, is uh, released and, and shed into our urine. And so we can actually test the production of sulforaphane. So we do a two-day intervention where we don't eat any cruciferous vegetables, we don't take our, our product, and then we, we will do a baseline urine test, test for the metabolites to make sure we are clear, and then we take our product and collect for 12 hours our urines, and then we're able to tell how much sulforaphane we're actually producing. And this is some of the early work where it shows you with a, two of our tablets, you get a, a, a finite amount of sulforaphane production. And the greatest thing is it's because we have the consistent levels of glucorapin and marasinase enzyme, we're now in over 20 human clinical studies, both in the United States and around the world. And Jihoon will talk a little bit about some of them, but I'm gonna wrap up here and pass it over to, to him. But our goal daily is to really develop rationally designed, high quality, innovative products backed by sound science that allow consumers to practically support their overall health and wellness. Kind of as I shared Hippocrates had said many, many years ago. And our Abmacol contains those standardized amounts of glucoraphanin and active marasinase. It's supported by lots of bench research, both in vitro and then real clinical research with the clinical trials. And then Ji Hoon is going to come up now and tell you a little bit about what he's seeing in his clinics in South Korea. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Ji Hoon Kim. Um, let me just uh, load my slide up. Hi, so I'm a clinician at a brain health clinic in South Korea. Uh, it's, it's exclusive for children on the autism spectrum. And uh, I've had the incredible fortune and the blessing to be one of the first clinics to utilize Avmacol. And uh, today I'll be sharing with you um, my experience. Uh, but uh, before I do, I wanted to share with you two things. Uh, first, I want to just introduce a little bit about our clinic so that uh, you're really able to um, interpret uh, the results um, and just kind of uh, get an idea of what other treatments were used uh, along with Avmacol. And secondly, I want to uh, talk about why and how I came to choose Avmacol uh, amongst the many broccoli-based supplements that are out there. Uh, so here is a little video clip that I prepared for today. Some of you might be familiar with uh, Brain Balance Achievement Centers um, and uh, our center uh, in Seoul uh, adheres to the same principle that one component of autism is a, a disconnection between the left and right brain. Um, and so we use uh, the body's various receptors to stimulate the part of the brain that is under-functioning and uh, use uh, timing exercises to um, uh, connect the two brains together coherently uh, time-wise. Um, so, uh, the children that are admitted to our clinic uh, range from uh, mild to severe ASD, including ADHD, tics, learning disabilities, uh, lack of social communication skills, and uh, just the whole gamut. 
Um, we perform uh, a lot of uh, tests. Uh, we start off with a functional neurological assessment. Uh, this would include um, assessment of their uh, reflexogenic movements such as cross crawl, uh, VOR, uh, uh, eye movements such as pursuits, saccades, uh, working memory, uh, hand and eye co dominance. Um, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, coherence of hand and eye dominance. Uh, uh, and uh, just try to get an idea of how their brain is functioning. Uh, and then we'll continue on with uh, urine organic acid exam, um, IgG food sensitivity. Um, we're hopeful that we can get some more autistic, uh, autism uh, genetic panel, but uh, uh, so far the only uh, access we have is the MTHFR SNP test. And um, I'm a huge, huge fan of uh, Dr. Stephanie Seneff, and, and she has really inspired me to become active in the GMO field. Uh, and as a result, we've come to offer the glyphosate levels uh, testing uh, uh, as well. Um, uh, Treatment-wise, uh, we uh, you know, stress and urge, the, uh, first of all, to eliminate all the inflammatory and the allergenic, the processed foods, um, uh, you know, gluten-free, casein-free, lectin-free, salicyclic-free, um, just uh, everything that's uh, harmful. And, um, uh, you know, just try to encourage a, 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 a plant-based diet um, uh, rich in phytonutrients and uh, fiber. Um, as you saw in the video, uh, we'll do these exercises. Uh, they're called hemispheric integration exercises. Um, and uh, for uh, really uh, children with developmental delay, we have uh, techniques uh, to uh, eliminate their primitive reflexes. Uh, and we have some uh, training sessions uh, to uh, improve their visual perception. Um, and also, uh, like, we'll send out videos like uh, how to do earthing and you know, avoid blue light, uh, reduce their EMF exposure, and so on. Just try to utilize everything that's uh, been said uh, at this seminar. And of course, supplements are a huge part of our clinic, um, but it, it can be a little uh, too much at times. Um, it, with all these tests, the child is left with uh, a dozen to 20 or so supplements, and uh, I guess part of my job is just to replace them with uh, real food uh, as much as possible. Um, so secondly, uh, I want to talk about why did I choose Avmacol amongst the, uh, a lot of the supplements out there. So, so my story begins uh, uh, in September 2017. Um, I was uh, driving and listening to Dr. Gregor's uh, nutritionfacts.org uh, uh, YouTube channel. I'm, not, uh, I'm sure many of you are aware. Uh, and he uploaded this three-part video series on sulforaphane, and um, he uh, talks about the, the immense benefits, uh, such, uh, like Dr. Konda had mentioned, the dampening of the neuroinflammation, um, the heat shock protein response, uh, uh, the activation of the NRF2 pathway to uh, uh, induce uh, phase two uh, detoxification pathways. And uh, he also talks about uh, the Singh and Zimmerman study of uh, 2014, where um, sulforaphane was administered to uh, f 50 uh, participants, uh, uh, boys uh, with autism ranging from uh, ages 13 to uh, 27, and uh, they saw uh, improvement in their aberrant behavior checklist scores by 34 uh, percent, and um, they improved their uh, social uh, responsiveness scale by 17 uh, percent. Um, and uh, when I heard that, I was like, I was, wow, you know, a single compound can do this, so I, I must have it uh, at my disposal. Um, so I, I got real interested, and I just kind of dug deeper into sulforaphane. And um, uh, as uh, Dr. Uh, Kornblatt had mentioned before, um, something uh, that's worthwhile mentioning again is that even though all of you are consuming broccoli, uh, you know, sulforaphane may have evaded you all your lifetime. And, and that is because uh, uh, when we, the traditional method that we cook the broccoli will uh, denature the myrosinase protein and um, even all you're left with is the glucoraphanin and uh, your uh, a bioavailability of sulforaphane is dependent upon the, uh, the availability of myrosinase uh, enzyme available from your micro, uh, microbes in your gut. Uh, and uh, there is actually a method to kind of improve the sulforaphane uh, bioavailability. Um, you could actually chop the broccoli first uh, before you cook it. Uh, that way you'll break the cell wall. 
uh, and uh, that will allow the myrosinase enzyme and the glucoraphanin to just kind of mesh together to produce the sulforaphane, and then you could lightly steam it. Um, and that's what I tried first, but uh, later on I learned that uh, broccoli sprouts contain up to 20 to 100 times more of the precursors for sulforaphane. So my immediate uh, reaction was um, I'm going to transform every available space of my clinic uh, to a broccoli sprout farm. <laughs> Um, but of course, I, I ended up ordering uh, just a bag of broccoli seeds and uh, 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 just a sprout growing plastic kit. Um, and a couple of days later, uh, I ended up with my first batch of broccoli sprouts. Um, and I have to be uh, very honest, uh, I can eat a lot of things. I'm, I'm, I'm Korean, I can eat a lot of fowl and, and you know, uh, bad things. <laughs> but um, broccoli sprouts were uh, extremely difficult to uh, eat. Uh, on a regular basis, and uh, and that is for a reason, is because the sulforaphane is actually nature's pesticide. Uh, it is actually meant to uh, deter the uh, the insects and the herbivores from consuming them all the time. Um, uh, but uh, regardless of the taste, you know, um, I really wanted to recommend this to my patients, and I met with the doc, uh, the parents of the autistic parents at our clinic. And I told them about, uh, I showed them this graph uh, of, the, of this immense improvement. And um, uh, when I met back with them, uh, you know, and obviously I told them to uh, you know, try this out. And I showed them my little project of growing the broccoli sprouts. But uh, when I met back with them, uh, not a single parent had done this. Uh, and this is not to criticize uh, their lack of diligence or anything, but um, it's essentially farming. You know, bro growing broccoli sprouts is, is not a, an easy job. Um, and so the lesson that I learned from that was, uh, you know, I couldn't, um, uh, you know, uh, give sulforaphane uh, uh, and uh, to and, and teach the the parents to grow broccoli sprouts on their own. So I had to turn my attention to supplements. Um, so I pretty much ordered everything that I could on the internet uh, and. Uh, when the instruction manuals uh, said take one capsule, I actually took five. Uh, if it said one scoop, I took as many as I could. Because uh, I just wanted to experience for myself uh, what the heat shock protein response felt like. Um, but uh, pretty much all the supplements um, weren't, uh, weren't so impressive uh, because all, all, pr pretty much all I felt was just a little less stiffness after exercise um, and nothing that would really blow me away. And then I came upon uh, this study uh, where uh, it compared the, um, the sulforaphane levels um, in your blood uh, after, consuming, uh, uh, after comparing the consumption of broccoli sprouts versus a, um, a product uh, purported to co uh, contain sulforaphane. Uh, and they used actually six capsules of it in the study. And so it was evident that uh, using supplements out in the market uh, couldn't deliver the therapeutic uh, dosage of uh, sulforaphane. Uh, so uh, I was left uh, in this place of irony and, and pretty much paralysis because, uh, you know, broccoli couldn't, uh, you had to literally eat like a box of broccoli to get the uh, dosage that you need and you would have to, and feeding broccoli sprouts is not an easy job. Uh, and broccoli supplements weren't that uh, effective. Um, and one day I just woke up and uh, it's like this moment of epiphany came and uh, I realized that in the Singh and Zimmerman study, they must have used a, uh, a valid and a reliable source of sulforaphane to uh, give to the participants in the study. And so that was my last hope. Uh, and so I emailed uh, Dr. Jed Fahey, who is the head of uh, the chemo prevention center at John Hopkins and also who had the uh, the Singh and Zimmerman study um, and he kindly wrote me back and that's when uh, he told me that Avamacol uh, is the product that they had tested uh, and it's a reliable source and um, later on I found out that Avamacol is uh, the uh, the choice of sulforaphane for all of these uh, studies uh, that are uh, related to sulforaphane. And uh, just to add further, because this is an autism seminar, uh, sulforaphane uh, 
Avmacol is used as the uh, choice of supplement for uh, all these uh, uh, additional uh, five studies uh, that has to do with autism uh, in China and in the States. So uh, by, it was October and I finally had my uh, bottle of Avmacol and uh, in, in walks this uh, uh, five-year-old autistic kid uh, and he's just screaming uh, so loud. It was, it was the, the most uh, severe uh, case of temper tantrums that I had ever witnessed. And, uh, you know, you would just look at him and he would scream. Uh, uh, and so I actually couldn't have a consultation with the mother. Um, so we ended up talking on the phone the next day. And she, uh, I, I told her, you know, your son is just really uh, sensitive and uh, unstable. I, I'm not sure if we could... Actually, uh, I'm not sure if he could do any type of exercise or, or just maybe stay still. Um, but I, I obviously told her about the diet that she could, you know, go on and all the tests uh, and, the, and the nutritional interventions that she could do. Uh, but, and I also told her about the abimacol and the sulforaphane. And two days later, uh, after, she took the, after she gave the abimacol to the child, uh, we were just uh, stunned uh, because... Um, she, she told me that the, the temper tensions had disappeared the next day and uh, he was doing uh, plank core exercises uh, on the first day uh, and it was just an amazing sight. Um, and uh, by the first month, uh, his classroom behavior was just um, uh, uh, undisruptive and uh, by the second month, uh, it was just so clear his language was uh, progressing at a, such a fast level. Um, and by the third month, uh, we could actually, uh, I could actually interact with him to uh, do all these uh, tests and, uh, you know, uh, observation of the eye movements. Uh, he had normal uh, eye reflexes like VOR, saccades, uh, pursuit. Um, uh, his cerebellar function was okay. Uh, he could read numbers uh, and he could also uh, memorize up to five numbers. So that, that was, uh, this was a pace that I have never experienced at my clinic before. Um, and by the fourth month, uh, uh, we did another test where he, um, uh, where we asked him to draw uh, uh, in the uh, space below, uh, where he would be asked to copy the images at the top. And uh, uh, I just want you to know that four months ago, uh, this kid didn't know I was there. Um, and uh, actually, when he drew this, uh, he still had his hand grasp reflex, so he wasn't able to use his index finger. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, he did a, a pretty good job of it. So my first uh, avma call uh, experience uh, was, uh, well, was pretty shocking. Um, I realized that, uh, you know, this, the temper tantrums, uh, the reduction of it, or just so sometimes an immediate sensation of it was uh, something that has been uh, repeatedly uh, said with uh, other parents. And um, one thing is that the speed at which these uh, children would uh, recover was just something uh, miraculous. So this is a mother, uh, an interview of a mother who was actually referred uh, uh, because the, the, the child, the, the first child who was on Abimacol saw such good results that, um, that, he, that, that she came in. And uh, she's a mother of a four-year-old uh, autistic, severely autistic child and who couldn't speak. And uh, two weeks into Abimacol, uh, he spoke his first words. So I uh, just wanted to share that. You were recommended the Abimacol. Yes. 아이가 먹고 나서 네. 음, 체험하셨던 거를 좀 말씀해 주세요. 처음에 아부마코를 먹기 전에는 되게 각성이 높았어요. 항상 음. 막 되게 시도 때도 없이 웃고 음. 분명 수용 언어가 되고 저랑 이제 상호 작용도 어느 정도 되는데 집중을 잘 못하고 음. 되게 각성도가 높아가지고 떠 있고 음. 뭔가 이렇게 날라다니는 느낌이 든다고 해야 되나요? 애가 음. 그래서. 아부마크를 추천받고 이제 먹이기 시작하니까 수 뭐라 그래야지 집중해서 듣는 게좀 좋아졌어요 확실히 음, 음. 저는 이제 반신반의를 했거든요 진짜로 음. 분명 다른 아이한테는 들을 수도 있겠지만 한테는 안 들을 수도 있다라고 음. 생각을 해서 그러면서 먹였는데 
수용 언어도 좋아지고 집중하는 것도 좋아지고 말을 시작하더라고요. 진짜 너무 깜짝 놀랐어요. 저는 아이가 말을 하기를 되게 기다렸지만 말을 한다는 거를 좀 현실 현실감이 좀안 느껴졌다고 해야 되나요? 얘가 진짜 말을 하는구나. 입을 입을 띄는구나 이런 생각이 네. Um, this next interview uh, is a mother of uh, a seven-year-old boy with uh, developmental delay and ADHD-like uh, symptoms. Um, she came to our clinic two and a half years ago, so she did the whole spectrum of uh, the nutritional intervention and, uh, and the diet and the exercise and everything just we could apply. Um, but there were issues that were still unresolved. Um, and I particularly want to share this video because uh, the uh, the most striking change that uh, with Abmacol is uh, the the improvement in sleep. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, ADHD kid children have uh, sleep disturbances. They don't take naps. Uh, they they take short interval sleeps. Um, but that is something that was totally uh, changed with uh, Abmacol. So. 본인 소개 부탁드릴게요. 네, 7세 발달 지원 아동 음. 남자아이를 키우고 있는 엄마입니다. 네, 네. 어, 아부마코를 어, 이제 내원하신 한 2년 정도 됐을 때 드셨어요. 어, 이제 그 당시 때그 먹기 전에 한 2년 정도 지냈을 때 어, 운동도 하고 뭐 식단 조절도 하고 어, 그럼에도 불구하고 좀 어, 풀리지 않았었던 점 네, 그게 어떤 거였는지 좀 말씀 음, 부탁드릴게요. 잠 들기까지가 좀 많이 시간이 많이 걸렸었어요. 어, 네. 그리고 어. 음, 혼자 이렇게 좀막 돌아다니고 어. 막 소리 내면서 다니고 음, 하는 거 보면 음, 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 음. 뭐 앉아 있지를 못했던 거 음, 그게 음, 조금 음. 네. 네, 네, 네. 네, 그러면은 아부마코를 아이가 먹고 나서 어, 어떤 면이 좀 관찰이 음, 되셨나요? 좀 차분해진 면도 많이 보였고요. 어, 그게 언제쯤 나타났죠? 그게 먹고 한 2, 2주? 2주? 2주 정도부터는 어, 네. 음, 좀 효과가 있는 것 같다 어, 그게 좀 느껴졌어요. 아, 네, 잠도 네. 밤에 누우면 은 네. 어두워야지 자는 그런 거는 있는데 네, 네. 그렇게 이렇게 조건 환경만 맞춰주면은 금방 음, 잠들고 금방 아침까지도 푹 자고. 음, 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 네. 어 그거 외에 아이의 어, 뭐 인지나 뭐 다른 면에서 음. 좀 이렇게 먹으면서 또좀 달라진 점이 있으신가요? 음, 일단 따로 이렇게 구몬 이런 음. 수업을 하고 있는데 네. 보면은 수, 수창이나 음. 이렇게. 순간적인 집중력이 좀 많이 좋아져서 이렇게 좀 받아들이는 게 음. 초반에 비해서는 음. 뭐좀 많이 음. 가능해졌다는 거. 음. 그러니까 뭐 초반에는 단어 한 두세 개 이렇게 음. 했는데 이제는 뭐한 여덟 개, 단어 음. 여덟, 다섯 개에서 한 여덟 개이 정도까지도 음. 이렇게 딱그 시간 안에 딱 그거 인지가 딱 되더라고. 음. 학, 학습이 다. 네, 네, 네. 네, 네. Oh, so this uh, next, uh, I just have a couple more interviews. Um, so this is uh, a, a mother of a, uh, a five-year-old five boy, and the boy was struck by uh, a bus and dragged for a, a couple meters. And after the accident, um, the boy uh, suffered like regression in his memory, uh, language, uh, and just cognition altogether. Uh, and uh, it's it's been uh, two years since the accident, but uh, he still had uh, you know uh, a lot of trouble just like communication wise, and uh, the uh, the speed at which he uh, just took off after Abmacol was so amazing. Um, so this is a uh, and I particularly want to share this video because if you look at Abmacol uh, and the way the mechanism it, it affects uh, the neurons is that it's a, essentially a, a regenerative uh, pathway. Uh, it actually, you know, it's a rehabilitative, regenerative um, mechanism. So uh, this was something that... 네, 네. 어, 전에 같은 경우에 이제 사고 나고 나서 네. 한글 자체를 아예 다 잊어버리고 1, 2, 3, 4도 다 아예 음. 잊어버렸었거든요. 네, 그래서 네. 여기 지금 센터에 근데 내원했을 음. 때 겨우 1, 2, 3 음. 정말 이렇게 열 가지 이제 음. 세고 겨우 음. 세는 그런 단계였는데 음. 여기 이제 와서 치료도 받고 음. 아부모 그거 같이 복용하고 음. 이러면서 
진짜 이제 음. 역으로도 세고 음. 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 많이 많이 네. 인식하는 게 좋아졌어요. 네, 네, 네. Uh, this next interview is a mother of a child uh, with uh, stuttering and tics. Um, and uh, I particularly want to share this interview because um, he recovered so quickly that we really didn't apply any other testing, like a urine organic acid exam. It was just a matter of two weeks, um, um, and he barely was able to do any exercises. It was just a probiotics, abmacol, and um, just the, uh, the anti-inflammatory diet. 아, 아, 아부마코를 먹고 아이가 어떤 면이 좀 바뀌었는지 좀 어, 공유를 좀 해주세요. 네, 네. 어, 저희 아이는 네. 학교 들어가고부터 약간 틱 증상이 있었고요. 네. 한 2년 전부터 말을 조금씩 더듬기 시작했는데 아, 네. 어, 학기 초에 음, 학교의 선생님 배로 아, 아. 이제 상담하러 갔는데. 네. 어, 책을 읽으면서 너무 많이 더듬어서 이렇게 어. 옆에 친구들이 많이 수근거렸다고 네, 네. 그래서 이제 발표에 자신감도 없고 어. 어, 스스로도 많이 음, 음. 힘들었다고 음. 그렇게 얘기하더라고요. 음. 그래서 음. 어, 치료에 이제 치료를 시작해야 되겠다고 음. 생각해서 네, 이곳에 네. 오게 됐고 또 아부마코를 먹고 한 2주 정도 지나고부터 음, 음. 어, 말 더듬는 게 너무 좋아져가지고 음, 제가 이게 음. <웃음> 이게 진짜인가 할 정도로 음. 좀 놀라 놀, 놀랬어요. 음, 그리고 지금 한한달 정도 지났는데 네. 말 더, 더듬는 거는 거의 좋아졌고 네. 지금 네. 틱 증상도 거의 지금 발견하지 못할 정도로 음. 지금 좋아진 상태입니다. 아, 네, 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 감사합니다. 네. 네. So this was the question that I I was really curious about was uh, whether um, the effects of sulforaphane, is it independent, uh, separate, or distinct from uh, other nutritional interventions? Um, uh, and uh, I, I have come to believe uh, from the six months uh, that it is so. And, and because it's a, it's a nutraceutical, uh, it works at the cellular level to send signals uh, to uh, ramp up the uh, uh, NRF2 pathway and the NF, NF kappa beta pathway and the heat shock protein response. I mean, that's not a mechanism that you see with nutritional interventions, right? Um, so, uh, just uh, this is a case uh, uh, interview with a mother uh, who uh, was, was admitted to our clinic six months uh, predating AVMA call. Uh, we did everything we could. The, the, the girl improved, uh, you know, a lot from. Uh, the, the testing and the, the supplements and the, and the brain exercises and so on, but uh, there were issues that were still unresolved and it was just a matter of a couple of days uh, when uh, all these issues just got um, untangled and, and gotten taken care of. Oh, sorry. ね、ブロンニク、アブマコルと僕を出そう。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね
안것 같아요. 어. 자기가 바로 얘기를 했고 네. 공중 사우나도 막 가고 음, <웃음> 네, 네. 공중 시설 어. 이런 거 너무 회피했었거든요. 근데 그렇군요. 바로 달라졌고 네. 네. 그게 계속 지속이 되었고요. 음. 이제 되게 신기한 건 일곱 살이 끝날 때까지 일곱 살을 몰랐는데 네. 1월에 아브마콜 먹고 바로 나는 여덟 살이라고 말을 했어요. <웃음> 내가 여덟 살이고 아. 우리 사촌 오빠는 아홉 살 아. 동생은 지금 한살더 먹어서 일곱 아. 살이 됐어. 네, 네. 이걸 한 번에 다 얘기를 하는 거예요. 음. So this is the last uh, thing I want to share. Um. Uh, last case I want to share. Uh, this is a, uh, a boy who was admitted to our clinic on uh, 2016. Um, he had uh, just a developmental delay, uh, you know, aggressive behavior, um, poor uh, fine and gross motor skills, uh, limited vocabulary. And uh, this is a test called uh, ROCF, Ray Ostrich, uh, where the, uh, the, the child is asked to uh, copy uh, in, the, in the space below the image at the top. And you, as you can see, he, did a, he did, had a very uh, difficult time with it. Uh, this is um, about eight months into the program with, uh, with the diet and the brain exercises, the probiotics. You see, obviously, you see some improvement. Um, and uh, this is after urine organic acid testing uh, and the supplementation. Uh, and obviously, there are some improvements there. Uh, this is uh, January. Um, and uh, we asked the child, but he just didn't have a good uh, focus at the time. And so that, that wasn't, uh, that didn't do too, too well. Uh, but it was at this point that Abmacol was available to us and uh, we, we told her about the research and, and she uh, went on uh, the Abmacol. And this is uh, May 4th, uh, 2018. Um, and when he drew this, we were all just shocked uh, uh, at his uh, just the visual skills. Um, uh, and uh, the mother actually uh, does not have any complaints about her son anymore, that she just discontinued the treatments altogether. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as, uh, as to sum, sum it up, uh, here are my, my personal clinical impressions of Abmacol after six months uh, of use. Um, there were absolutely no side effects uh, reported from the mothers. Uh, the tablets are relatively uh, small and easy to feed. Uh, there are drastic, uh, in some in some cases, immediate cessation of temper tantrums. Um, there is definitely an improved quality of sleep, uh, and also a calming effect as well. Um, the rate at which these children improved uh, uh, in their motor skills and nonverbal communication skills, social interaction was uh, just something that I have I have never witnessed before. Um, and uh, just every day I would sit in my room and uh, these children would, would come in and they would be seek, speaking these uh, long sentences and uh, I would just be in awe uh, every day. It's just new vocabulary. Uh, it, was, it was pretty cool. And um, uh, the changes have been reported as fast as two hours uh, to long as two weeks. Um, the, uh, some have reported a, a hyperactivity mostly uh, when they discontinued the product um, and it was because we didn't have enough uh, available. And uh, for me, um, a part of my job is to consult with the parents uh, when their child goes, uh, re when their child's tick symptoms kind of reappears. And um, 2000, in 2018, I was um, I didn't have much consultation about that, so I, I just wanted to include that in there because um, certainly there uh, were no uh, very limited number of consultations regarding ticks, um, and that's what my job mostly entails. Um, uh, and uh, obviously, the nutraceutical effect of sulforaphane is uh, something that is independent uh, from the nutritional interventions, and I, I believe that. Um, you know, Avmacol is one of the most cost-effective strategies against uh, ASD, uh, if not the most. Um, so uh, with that, I want to end my talk. Uh, I would like to thank these people uh, listed here. Um, and I, I've been a long uh, a fan of Autism One, and it's been such a great experience uh, coming here and, and seeing all these speakers uh, for the first time. It's almost like being in a movie set, to, actually, to be honest. Uh, so thank you, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you to all of you. I think Brian will come up uh, to answer some of your questions.